This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie with fifty million reasons why salvation is by faith alone in christ alone by grace alone a sovereign god give faith to man salvation's in the maker's hand this gospel offends rome today they offer up Another way, a counterfeit, a compromise Beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello and welcome to a new video from Jockler 66, Hour of the Truth. This is the next reading of the book The History of the Inquisition by Philip from Limborg, a Dutchman who wrote this book in 1692 and that was translated by Samuel Chandler in 1731. Now, I told you that I probably will do this book without any preparation but with the chapter that I am reading right now that is very very hard and I ask already on beforehand a little bit forgiveness for here and there if I'm going to stutter or not being so clear as otherwise I am with my reading because the reading is difficult and we are dealing with a subject that I absolutely do not like but we have to work through it. We are dealing with the Council of Nicaea that was called in 325 by the pagan, even though some people say that he converted to Christianity, Emperor Constantine. He never converted to Biblical Christianity. He was the one who covered the pagan Roman Empire with the garments of Christianity. And the Council of Nicaea in 325 that we are going to talk about here in the next reading, upcoming reading now, is the one that introduced the damnable, satanic trinity into the church. What is my standpoint on the trinity? Very easy. There is no trinity. Our Lord is one God, already the Israelites in the Old Testament said. There is only one God, the Father, and His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. If anything, God is a twofold, never a trinity. 
But of course the Roman Catholic Church likes to tell you that there is a trinity. What do you think? Why do they have the pyramid as the symbol? The pyramid, the triangle, just represents the unholy trinity. And there is no trinity in biblical Christianity. There is the Father and there is the Son. And they have the same spirit. And that is the spirit that was sent to us on earth when Jesus Christ descended up into heaven. But the Holy Spirit is never ever in the Bible, not in one verse, referred to as a third person. So when they say the Trinity is Father, Son and the Holy Ghost, uh, uh, that is not to be found in the Bible. There is one God, the Father, and Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son. Before I'm going to do a discussion here on my own, I take the book and I will read it, but I tell you that all these things, especially the ones that we are going to read now, that is the quarrel between Alexander and Arius, that what we stopped already with in the last reading of this book, I will not go into that. I will not go into discussion of that point, because there just is no Trinity. Okay, the Trinity is an unbiblical heresy. So we're going to continue in the part that is uh, marked in yellow. The first step he took to heal this breach, he is Emperor Constantine. The breach between Alexander and Arius. Yeah? The first step he, Constantine, took to heal this breach was right and prudent. He sent his letters to Alexandria, exhorting Alexander and Arius to lay aside their differences and become reconciled to each other. He tells them that after he had diligently examined the rise and the progress of this affair, he found the occasion of the difference to be very trifling and not worthy such serious contentions, and that therefore he promised himself that his mediation between them for peace would have the desired effect. The emperor appears here as the mediator, yeah, as the mediator between two quarreling parties. This is exactly what the Antichrist is today, the Pope, who is always the mediator between two quarreling parties and therefore can himself pose in this world as the man of peace, where nobody understands that he controls the two quarreling parties. And then of course it is easy to appear as the man of peace. But anyway, he tells Alexander, so Constantine tells Alexander, that he required from his presbyters a declaration of their sentiments concerning a silly, empty question. And Arius, that he had imprudently uttered what he should not have, what he should not have even thought of, or what he at least be ought to have kept secret in his own breast, and that therefore questions about such things should not have been asked, or, if they had been asked, should not have been answered, that they proceeded from an idle itch of disputation and were in themselves of so high and difficult a nature as that they, should not, uh, they could not be exactly comprehended or suitably explained, and that to insist on such points too much before the people could produce no other effect than to make some of them talk blasphemy and others even turn schismatics, and that therefore, as they did not contend about any essential doctrine of the gospel, nor introduce any new heresy concerning the worship of God, 
they should again communicate with each other. And finally, that notwithstanding their sentiments in these unnecessary and trifling matters were different from each other, they should acknowledge one another as brethren, and, laying aside their hatreds, return to a firmer, friend, to a, a firmer friendship and affection than before. But religious hatreds were not so easily removed, and the ecclesiastical combatants were too warmly engaged to follow this kind and wholesome, uh, and, and wholesome advice. The bishops of each side had already interested the people in their quarrel and heated them into such a rage that they attacked and fought with, wounded and destroyed each other and acted with such madness as to commit the greatest impieties for the sake of orthodoxy, and arrive to that pitch of insolence as to offer great indignities to the imperial images. The old controversy about the time of celebrating Easter being now revived added fuel to the flames and rendered their animosities too furious to be appeased. Constantine, being greatly disturbed upon this account, sent letters to the bishops of the several provinces of the empire to assemble together at Nice, or Nicaea, in Bithynia, and accordingly great numbers of them came, AC 325. Some through hopes of profit, and others out of curiosity to see such a miracle of an emperor, and many of them, as Sozomen informs us, to negotiate their own private affairs and to redress their grievances, their grievances by accusing those who had injured them. The number of them that was uh, the number of them was three hundred and eighteen, besides a vast numbers of presbyters, deacons, ecolithists, uh, and others. Now, here I'm going to interrupt for a second because I think there are many people listening to this reading right now who have no idea what an ecolithist is, and I had no idea what an ecolithist was either. So I looked it up, and I will provide the link that you can study it for yourself in the description box of the video, but tell you so far that the definition of an acolyte is a person who attends to the altar in church and assists the performance of liturgical, liturgical rites. One example of an acolyte is an altar boy. An example of an acolyte in the Roman Catholic Church is the person who prepares the wine and water during Mass. Okay, That should suffice for now. We have the number of 318, besides vast numbers of presbyters, deacons, ecolithists and others. Now we know at least what ecolithists are. The ecclesiastical historians tell us that in this vast collection of bishops, some were remarkable for their gravity, patience under sufferings, modesty, integrity, eloquence and the like virtues. But yet they all agree that there were others of very different characters. The historian Eusebius tells us some came to the council with worldly views of gain, and Theodoret that others were subtle and crafty and of a quarrelling malicious temper and actuated with a spirit of revenge instead of the spirit of reconciliation, huh? the spirit of revenge. Now, and indeed, this appeared immediately upon opening of the council. For after the Emperor Constantine, who honored his assembly with this presence, had exhausted them to lay aside all their differences and to enter into measures of union and peace instead of applying themselves to the work for which they were convened. They began shamefully to accuse each other before him and raised great disturbances in the council by their mutual charges and reproaches. Sabinus also uh, saith they were generally a set of very ignorant men, destitute of knowledge and of learning. But as Sabinus was an heretic of the Mid uh, Macedonian sect, probably his testimony may, uh, may be thought exceptionable 
and even supposing his charge to be true, yet Socrates brings, of, uh, brings them off by telling us that they were enlightened by God and the grace of his Holy Spirit and so could not possibly err from the truth. But as some men may possibly question the truth of their inspiration, so, uh, so I think it appears but too plain that an assembly of men who met, to, who met together with such different views were so greatly prejudiced and enshamed against each other and are allowed many of them to be ignorant till they received miraculous illuminations from God did not seem very likely to heal the differences of the church or to examine with that wisdom, care and impartiality or to enter into those measures of condescension and forbearance that were necessary to lay a solid foundation for peace and unity. Lay a solid foundation for peace and unity. Now, you have to understand that there will not be peace until Jesus Christ comes again. And they were trying in that council to lay a solid foundation for peace and unity. That is exactly what is going on in the world today. The Pope comes out and preaches peace and unity all together under the wings of Rome. One world religion, one world government, a new world order. Already here we see the origins. They were trying to lay a solid foundation for peace and unity. Whereas Jesus Christ told us, especially in Matthew 24, there will be no peace until he comes back. Matthew 24 is a very interesting chapter of the Bible that is vastly wrongly understood. Because a lot of people think that Jesus Christ tells something about the time when he was living until the time of the temple being destroyed and the end of the time. And they draw a line in there so that they can put in there falsely seven year tribulation and probably even the rapture of the church which are unholy jesuitical wrong satanic teachings matthew 24 is a very interesting subject of the bible that we can talk about some other time now i am busy with reading this book but you have to see here that we are speaking about in uh, AC 325, the Council of Nicaea, that they were already here taking measures that were necessary to lay a solid foundation for peace and unity. Something that Jesus Christ told the Apostles would not happen until he comes back. Now, the author continues, however, the emperor brought them at last to some temper, so that they fell in good earnest creed making and drew up and subscribed that which from the place where they were assembled was called Nicene. By the accounts of the transactions in this assembly given by Athanasius himself, in his letter to the African bishops, it appears that they were determined to insert into the creed such words as were most obnoxious to the Arians, uh, where we have Arianism from, uh, the Arians, and thus to force them to a public separation from the church. Um, just a little explanation. The Arians, Arianism is a man-centered gospel. And the, Aramen, uh, the Arians of North Africa, as we can hear, letter to the African bishops, yeah? African bishops to the Arians, those are the Vandals. And their um, capital was Carthage. And you know the Romans celebrated their defeat of Carthage. And you know that 
when the little horn came into power, three other horns were uprooted, were taken out with the root, and those were, among others, the Heruli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. The Vandals, who lived in northern Africa, and were Aryans in Carthage. Just a little side information. For when they resolved to condemn some expressions which the Aryans were charged with making use of, such as, the sun was a creature, there was a time when he was not, and the like, and to establish the use of others in their room, such as, the sun was the only begotten of God by nature, the word, the power, the only wisdom of the Father and true God, the Aryans immediately agreed to it. Upon this, the fathers made an alteration and explained the words from God by the sons being of the substance of God. And when the Arians consented also to this, the bishop's father added to render the creed more exceptionable that he was consubstantial or of the same substance with the father. And when the Arians objected that this expression was wholly unscriptural, the Orthodox urged that thought it was so, yet the bishops had lived an hundred and thirty years before them made use of it. At last, however, all the council subscribed. The creed thus altered and amended, except five bishops, who were displeased with the word consubstantial and made many objections against it. Now Eusebius, Bishop of Caesarea was also in doubt for a considerable time, whether he should set his hand to it and refuse to do it till the exceptionable words had been fully debated amongst them, and he had obtained an explication of them suitable to his own sentiments. Thus, when it was asserted by the creed that the Son was of the Father's substance, the negative explication agreed to by the bishops was exactly the same thing that was asserted by Arius, meaning that, quote, he was not a part of the father's substance, unquote. Again, as the words begotten, not made, were applied to the son, they determined the meaning to be that the son was produced after a different manner than the creatures, uh, than the creatures which he made and was therefore of a more excellent nature than any of the creatures, and that the manner of his generation could not be understood. This was the very doctrine of Arius and Eusebius of Nicomedia, who declared that as the Son was not part of God, so neither was he from anything created, and that the manner of his generation was not to be described. And as to the word consubstantial to the Father, it was agreed by the Council to mean no more than that the Son had no likeness with any created beings, but was in all things like to him that begot him, and that he was not from any other, um, from any other hypostasis, or substance of the fathers. Now, this word hypostasis was also new to me, and uh, I will explain that uh, in the Wikipedia link that you can go to in the description box of the video. Yeah. Of this sentiment also were Arius. Well, well, but of course, if you want to, I can also explain that right now, and uh, let's just see. Uh, we are doing this, uh, so you see how I <laughs> do a live video, yeah. and we're going to go into this, um, into this explanation from Wikipedia. Yeah, no, I told you to go. So, hypostasis is the underlying state or underlying substance and is the fundamental reality that supports all else. In Neoplatonism, the hypothesis of the soul, the intellect, 
and the one was addressed by Plotonius. In Christian theology, hypostasis or person is one of the three persons of the Trinity. So the word that the author uses here, hypostasis, yeah, is a pagan word. Has its roots in, as you can read here, in philosophy and religion. Yeah? It comes out from Aristotle. It has to do with Neoplatonism. Uh, it has to do with Plato. It is not biblical. The word hypostasis is one of the three persons of the Trinity. There is no Trinity. The Trinity is unbiblical, is Babylonian, is satanic. So, scrap the word hypostasis, but you just have to understand it here in the context of the text. He was not from any other hypostasis or person or substance but the fathers. Well, we are dealing with the very dangerous teaching of the Trinity here. Of this sentiment also were Arius and Eusebius, his friend, who maintained not only his being of a more excellent original than the creatures, but that he was formed of an immutable and in, uh, inessible uh, substance and nature, and after the most perfect likeness of the nature and power of him that formed him. <laughs> so, when you understand this correctly, then Jesus Christ is, according to their teaching, a created being yeah? of the nature and power of him that formed him. The Bible speaks about that the potter forms the clay, which are we. We are created beings. So here, you, with, the, with this explanation, Jesus Christ is put on the same level as the rest of created beings. And that is not correct. These were the explications of these terms agreed to by the Council. The Council of Nicaea, a Roman Catholic, the very first Roman Catholic Council, remind you, upon which Eusebius and Caesarea subscribed them in the Creed. And though some of the Arian bishops refused to do it, yet it doth not appear to me that it proceeded from their not agreeing in the sense of these explications, but because they apprehended that the words were very improper and implied a great deal more than was pretended to be meant by them. Casistry and Sophistry and especially because an anathema was added upon all who should presume not to believe in them and use them. Now Eusebius of Caesarea gives a very extraordinary reason for his subscribing this anathema, meaning because it forbids the use of unscriptural words, the introducing which he assigns as the occasion of all differences and disturbances which had troubled the church. But he had been consistent he had been consistent with himself. He ought never to have subscribed this creed for the very reason he alleges why he did it, because the anathema forbids only the unscriptural words of Arius, such as he was made out of nothing. Where have we heard that before? Made out of nothing. There was a time when he was not. <laughs> well, we know that the Bible says that Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. So there was no time when he was not. You know, when people always try to understand things they cannot understand, when a carnal mind trying to understand divine things, that just cannot happen. Just keep to the, to the word, keep to the Bible. But did you ever see in the last page and a half that I read to you anything mentions of Holy Scripture, where the Holy Scripture is basic, where they mention Holy Scripture? I don't see that. 
So he says he was made out of nothing. There was a time when he was not. No. And the like. But allowed and made sacred the unscriptural expressions of the orthodox meaning of the father's substance and consubstantial and cut out uh, cut off from christian communion those who would not agree to them though they were highly exceptionable to the arian party and afterwards proved the occasions of many cruel persecutions and evils in this public manner did the bishops assert a dominion over the faith and consciences of others, and assume a power not only to dictate to them what they should believe, but even to anathematize and expel from the Christian Church all who refused to submit to their decisions and own their authority. Now, this is a sentence that can be transported right from when the author wrote it in 1692 and dealing with the history in the in the early fourth century after christ has died to today in this public manner that the bishops assert a dominion over the faith and consciences of others and assume assume don't have but they assume a power not only to dictate them what they should believe, but even to anathematize and expel from the Christian Church all who refuse to submit to their decisions and own their authority. Everything that was said here, that already came up at the Council of Nicaea, as we can read here, is the same that was actually then just confirmed at the devilish, satanic Council of Trent in 1545 to 1563 rome never changes you see everything that was dealt with in the council of trent was already dealt with in the council of nicaea the very first council where the roman catholic church came together after in 321 the emperor constantine made quote unquote christianity the state religion of the then pagan roman empire rome never changes for after they had carried their creed they proceeded to excommunicate arius and his followers and banished arius from alexandria they also condemned his explication of his own doctrine and a certain book called thalia which he had written concerning it. After this, they sent letters to Alexandria and to the brethren in Egypt, Libya and Pentapolis to acquaint them with their decrees and to inform them that the Holy Senate had condemned the opinions of Arius and were so zealous in this affair that they had not patience so much as to hear his ungodly doctrine and blasphemous words that they had fully determined the time for the celebration of Easter. Now, it's called the Holy Synod had condemned the opinions of Arius. Why is this Holy Synod not holy at all? Because only one can make something holy, he that is holy. And the God of the Bible was not in that Synod. So that is not a Holy Synod. I think we here and there have to make the point that even when the author uses these words that we have to refer to the Bible that only he who is holy can make something holy and God did not sanctify that synod so it was not holy but of course in the eyes of the Roman Catholic Church it was holy finally the author continues they exhort them to rejoice for the good deeds they had done 
and for that they had cut off all manners of heresy, and to pray that their right transactions might be established by Almighty God and our Lord Jesus Christ. When these things were over, Constantine splendidly treated the bishops, uh, filled their pockets, <laughs> and sent them honorably home advising them as parting to maintain peace amongst themselves and that none of them should envy another who might excel the rest in wisdom and eloquence and that such should not carry themselves haughtily towards their inferiors but consent to and bear with their weakness. A plain demonstration that he saw into their tempers uh, that he saw into their tempers, and was no stranger to the pride and haughtiness that influenced some, and the envy and hatred that actuated others. After he had thus dismissed them, he sent several letters, com recommending and enjoying an universal conformity to the Council's decrees both in ceremony and doctrine, using, amongst other things, this argument for it, that what they had decreed was the will of God, and that the agreement of so great a number of such bishops was by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. A very important sentence. After he had thus dismissed them, he sent several letters recommending and enjoining an universal conformity to the Council's decrees both in ceremony and doctrine. Do we understand what the author tells us here? A universal, a Catholic conformity to the Council decrees both in ceremony and in doctrine. In Every place where these bishops were afterwards sent to, the place where they originally came from, from Nicaea, from Byzantium, from North Africa, you know, all the places where they come from, they were sent to with the message of a universal, meaning a Catholic conformity, concerning ceremony and doctrine. That means that wherever one of these bishops performed his duties, they were over every place they were the same. The ceremony that was performed were the same, and the doctrines based on how the ceremony was performed was the same. Universal. Another word for universal is Catholic. And of course, then they say that what they had decreed was the will of God, because it was a holy synod, and that the agreement of so great a number of such bishops was the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. So because this great a number of such bishops, they were in agreement, that must have been the Holy Ghost. So here you have, because that was Constantine who put them all together, you have that Constantine takes the place of the Holy Ghost. I cannot understand this sentence in any other way. That what they had decreed was the will of God and that the agreement of so great a number of bishops was the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Without the Holy Ghost, they say, all these different bishops, this great number of bishops, could have never been put unto an agreement. That must have been the work of the Holy Ghost. While it was the work of Emperor Constantine, and not of the Holy Ghost. Not of the Holy Ghost. It is natural here to observe that the anathemas and the dispositions agreed on by this Council of Nicaea and confirmed by the imperial Constantine's authority 
were the beginning of all the persecutions that afterwards raged against each party in their turns. As the civil power had now taken part in the controversies about religion, by authorizing the dominion of the bishops over the consciences of others, enforcing their ecclesiastical constitutions and commanding the universal reception of that faith they had decreed to be orthodox, it was easy to foresee that those who opposed them would employ the same arts and authority to establish their own faith and power and to oppress their enemies the first favorable opportunity that presented. At this the event abundantly made good. And indeed, how should it be otherwise? For doctrines that are determined merely by dint of numbers and the awes of worldly power carry no manner of conviction in them and are not likely, therefore, to be believed on these accounts by those who have once opposed them. And as such methods of deciding controversies equally suit all principles, the in, uh, introducing them by any party gives but to plausible a presence to every party, when uppermost to use them in its turn, and though they may agree well enough with the views of spiritual ambition, yet they can be of no service in the world to the interest of true religion, because they are directly contrary to the nature and spirit of it, and because arguments which equally prove the truth and excellency of all principles cannot in the least prove the truth of any. If one may form a judgment of the persons who composed this council, from the small accounts we have left of them, they do not, I think, appear to have met uh, so such with design impartially to debate on this subject and controversy as to establish their own authority and opinions, establish their own authority and opinions, and oppress their enemies. For besides what hath been already observed concerning their temper and qualifications, Theodoret informs us that when those of the Arian party proposed in writing to the synod the form of faith they had drawn up, the bishops of the orthodox side no sooner read it, but they gravely tore it in pieces and called it a spurious and false confession. And after they had filled the place with noise and confusion, universally accused them of betraying the doctrine according to godliness. Doth such a method of proceeding suit very well with the character of the synod inspired as the good emperor declared by the Holy Ghost? Is truth and error to be decided by noise and tumult? Was this the way to convince gainsayers and reconcile them to the unity of the faith? Or could it be imagined that the dissatisfied part of this venerable assembly could acquiesce the tyrannical determination of such a majority and patiently submit to excommunication, patiently submit to deposition and the condemnations of their opinions almost unheard and altogether unexamined? How justly does the censure pass this Gregory Nazianzen, upon the councils that were held in this time, agree to this famous one of Nice. If, says he, I must speak the truth, this is my resolution, to avoid all counsels of the bishops, for I have not seen any good end answered by any synod whatsoever, for, they love, for their love of contention and their lust of power are too great even for words to express. The emperor's conduct to the bishops met at Nice, of Nicaea, is full proof of the former, for when they were met in council, they immediately 
fell to wrangling and quarrelling and were not to be appeased and brought to temper till Constantine interposed, artfully persuaded some, shaming others into silence and heaping commendations on those fathers that spoke agreeable to his sentiments. The decisions they made concerning the faith and their excommunications and depositions of those who differed from them demonstrate also their affection, uh, the affectation of power and dominion. But as they had great reason to believe that their own decrees would be wholly insignificant without the interposition of the imperial authorities to enforce them, they soon obtained their desires, the emperor readily confirming all they had determined and enjoining all Christians to submit themselves to them. His first letters to this purpose were mild and gentle, but he was persuaded into more violent measures, for out of his great zeal to extinguish heresy, he put forth public edicts against the authors and maintainers of it, and particularly against the Novatians, Valentians, Marcionicists, and others whom, after repro uh, reproaching with being enemies of truth, destructive counsellors, and withholding opinions suitable to their crimes, he deprives of the liberty of meeting together for worship, either in public or private places, and gives all their oratories to the Orthodox Church. And with respect to the Arians, he banished Arius himself, ordered all his followers, his, as absolute enemies of Christ, to be called Porphyrians, or uh, from Porphyrus, an heathen who wrote against Christianity, ordained that the books written by them should be burned, that there might be no remains of their doctrine left to posterity, and most cruelly commanded that if ever anyone should dare to keep in his possession any book written by Arius, and should not immediately burn it, he should be no sooner convicted of the crime, but he should suffer death. Thus the Orthodox first brought in the punishment of heresy with death, and persuaded the emperor to destroy those whom they could not easily convert. Edmond Paris wrote a book in the 20th century, published by Chick Publications, that is called Convert or Die. That deals mainly with the Holocaust that happened in the 1940s in the Balkans of Europe, where the Orthodox Serbs were persecuted and they had the choice either to convert or to die. And in this sentence that we've just read, thus the Orthodox first brought in the punishment of heresy with death and persuaded the emperor to destroy those whom they could not easily convert. This is, my dear listeners, this is the beginning of the Inquisition. Remember, we are reading a book that is called The History of the Inquisition. They persuaded the emperor who then later, when he fell away, was replaced by the Pope of Rome, the Antichrist, to destroy those whom they could not easily convert, meaning to kill them. So the people are giving the choice to convert or die. The scriptures were now no longer the rule and standard of the Christian faith. Ah, no! The teaching of the universal church was now the rule and standard of the quote-unquote Christian, of the Catholic faith. 
orthodoxy and heresy were from henceforward to be determined by the decisions of councils and fathers and religion to be propagated no longer by the apostolic methods of persuasion, forbearance and the virtues of an holy life, but by imperial edicts and decrees. These are today papal bulls and heretical gainsayers not to be convinced that they might be brought to the acknowledgement of the truth and be saved, but to be persecuted and destroyed. It is no wonder that after this there should be a continual fluctuation of the public faith, just as the prevailing parties had the imperial authority to support them, or that we should meet with little else in ecclesiastical history but violence and cruelties committed by men who had left the simplicity of the Christian faith and profession, enslaved themselves to ambition and avarice, and had before them the ensnaring views of the temporal grandeur, high performance and large revenues. Since the time that avarice had increased in the churches, says St. Jerome, the law of the priest and, of the, vision, uh, and the vision of the prophet hath failed. Whilst all contend for the episcopal power, which they unlawfully seize and without the church's leave, they apply to their own uses all that belongs to the Levites. The miserable priests begs in the streets. They die with hunger who are commanded to bury others. They ask for pity who are commanded to pity others. The priest's only care is to get money. Hence, hatreds arise through the avarice of the priests. Hence, the bishops are accused by their clergy. Hence, the quarrels of the prelates. Hence, the causes of desolations. Hence, the rise of their wickedness. Religion and Christianity seem indeed to be the least thing that either the contending parties had at heart, by the infamous methods they took to establish themselves and ruin their adversaries. If one reads the complaints of the Orthodox writers against the Arians, one would think the Arians the most execrable set of men that ever lived, they being loaded with all the crimes that can possibly be committed, and represented as bad or even worse than the devil himself. But no wise man will easily credit these accounts, with, uh, which the Orthodox give of their enemies. Because, as Socrates tells us, this was the practice of the bishops towards all they deposed, to accuse and pronounce them impious, but not to tell others the reasons why they accused them as such. This was for their purpose to expose them to the public odium and make them appear impious to the multitude, that so they might get them expelled from their rich seas, and be translated to them in their rooms. And this they did as frequently as they could, to the, uh, to the introducing infinite calamities and confusions into the Christian Church. And if the writings of the Arians had not been prudently destroyed, I doubt not, but we should have found as many charges laid by them, with equal justice against the Orthodox as the Orthodox have produced against them, their very sub uh, suppression of the Arian writings being a very strong presumption against them, and, they, and the many imperial edicts of Constantine, Theodosius, uh, Valent, uh, Valentinian, Martian, and others against heretics being an abundant demonstration that they had a deep share in the guilt of persecution. 
Now, Alexander, Bishop of Alexandria, in his letter to the Bishop of Constantinople, complains that Arius and others, desirous of power and riches, did day and night invent calumnies, and were continually exciting seditions and persecutions against them. And Arius, in his turn, in his letter to Eusebius and Nicodemia, with too much justice charges Pope Alexander and violently persecuting and oppressing him upon account of what he called the truth, and using every method to ruin him, driving him out of the city as an artificial person for not agreeing with him on the sentiments of the Trinity. Athanasius also bitterly exclaims against the cruelty of the Arians in his apology for his flight. Whom have they not, says he, used with the greatest indignity that they have been able to lay hold of? Who hath ever fallen into their hands that they have had any spite against? whom they have not so cruelly treated as either to murder or to mean him? What place is there where they have not left the monuments of their barbarity? What church is there which doth not lament their treachery against their bishops? Now after this passionate exclamation he mentions several bishops they had banished or put to death and the cruelties they made use of to force the orthodox to renounce the faith and to subscribe to the truth of the Arian doctrines. But might it not have been asked who it was first brought in excommunications, depositions, banishments and death as the punishments of heresy? Could not the Arians recriminate with justice? Were they not reapproached by atheists, anathematized, expelled their churches, exiled and made liable to the punishment of death by the Orthodox? Did not even they who complained to the cruelty of the Arians in the most moving terms create numberless confusions and slaughters by their violent intrusions into the seas of their adversaries? Was not Athanasius himself also accused of the emperor by many bishops and clergymen who declared themselves orthodox, of being the author of all the seditions and disturbances in the church, by excluding great multitudes from the public service of it, of murdering some, putting others in chains, punishing others with stripes and whippings, and of burning churches? And if the enemies of Athanasius endeavoured to ruin him by subbent witnesses and false accusations, Athanasius himself used the same practices to destroy his adversaries, and particularly Eusebius of Nicomedia, by, uh, by spiriting up a woman to charge Eusebius with getting her with child, the falsehood of which was detected at the Council of Tyre. His very ordination also to the Bishop of Alexandria was censured as clandestine and illegal. These things being reported to Constantine, he ordered a synod to meet at Caesarea in Palestine, of which place Eusebius Pamphilus was bishop, before whom Athanasius refuted to appear. But after the council was removed to Tyre, he was obliged to force to come thither and command to empower the several crimes objected against him. Some of them he declared himself of, and as to others he desired more time for his vindication. At length, after many sessions, both his accusers and the multitude who were present in the council demanded his deposition as an, emperor, uh, as an impostor, a violent man and unworthy of the priesthood. Upon this Athanasius fled from the synod, after which they condemned him, and deprived him of bishopric, and ordered that he should never more enter Alexandria, to prevent his exciting tumults and seditions. They also wrote to all the bishops to have no communion with him, as to convicted of many crimes, and as having convicted himself by, fight of, uh, by flight of many others, to which he had not answered. And for this their uh, and, sorry, and for this their procedure, 
they assigned these reasons that he despised the emperor's orders by not coming to Caesarea, that he became that he came with a great number of persons to Tyre and excited tumults and disturbances in the council, sometimes uh, refusing to answer to the crimes objected against him, at other times reviling all the bishops, sometimes not obeying their summons and at others refusing to submit to their judgment, that he was fully and evidently convinced of breaking in pieces their sacred cup by fix the bishops who had sent into Egypt to inquire of the truth. Athanasius, however, appealed to Constantine and gave him such a representation of the council's transactions as greatly offended him. But when Eusebius and others laid the whole matter before him, the emperor entirely altered his sentiments, confirmed his deposition and banished him into France. Indeed, Athanasius, notwithstanding his sad complaints under persecution and his expressly calling it a diabolical invention, yet seems to be against it only when he, was, uh, when he and his own party were persecuted, but not against persecuting the enemies of orthodoxy. In his letter to Epictetus, bishop of Corinth, he, he saith, quote, I wonder that your piety hath borne these things, meaning the heresies he had before mentioned, and that you did not immediately put those heretics under restraint and propose the true face to them, that if they would not forbear to contradict, they might be declared heretics, for it is not to be endured that these things should be either said or heard amongst Christians. Unquote. And in another place he says, what they ought to, he had in universal hatred for opposing the truth, and comforts himself that the emperor, upon due information, would put a stop to their wickedness, and that they would not be long lived. And to mention no more, I therefore exhort you, says he, let no one be deceived, but as though the Jewish piety was prevailing over faith of Christ, be ye all zealous in the Lord, and let every one hold, uh, hold faith of the faith that he hath received from the fathers, which also the fathers met together at Nice, and were declared in writing, and endure, uh, endure none of those who may attempt to make any innova innovations therein. It is needless to produce more instances of this kind. Whosoever gives himself the trouble of looking over any of the writings of his father, he will, he will find in them the most serious invectives. Well, the most serious invectives. Well, that's a word that I don't know. <laughs> the most serious invectives against the Arians, and that he studiously endeavors to represent them in such colors as might render them in the abhorrence of mankind and excite the world to their utter extirpation. Now, I'm going to stop here right now because we have already gone a little bit more than one hour of this reading that takes quite a lot out of me and I guess even takes quite a lot out of you also when you listen to this. But I hope that you understand that we are going here about the Nicene, what is called the Nicene Creed. We were talking about the Council of Nicaea in 325 and the establishment of what was called heresy at that time. And we learned, actually, that the basis of the Roman Catholic Church was there from the start. You had 321 when Constantine was actually making quote-unquote, Christianity, the state religion of the pagan Roman Empire, we have learned today that from that moment on, it was a politic of convert or die, laying the foundations of the later coming Inquisition. With that, 
I remain until the next reading of Limborch's book, The History of the Inquisition. Joggler from 66, uh, Joggler 66, signing off. Until next time. God bless you, and bye bye.